Ron here from the hit podcast, The Other Side of Wall Street. And if you're like most of us here in the trading community, you no doubt have mentors or experts that you look up to for trading advice and knowledge. Well, how many times have you wished you could just sit down with one of those experts and have a good old one-on-one -on -one conversation with no script, no planned questions, just a friendly chat? Well, that's what we're bringing to you here. Each week, we'll visit with a different expert and have an up-close and personal conversation about anything and everything involving trading. So sit back and enjoy as we get to know our special guest. Welcome to The Other Side of Wall Street with your host, Ron Harrison. You know, if you do well enough and you present a reasonable product, someone's going to talk to someone else and go, okay, you should get this guy, come along and, you know. You know, it's an interesting thing that i found is like when I'll give a class or many classes, whatever, I'll teach the same thing to every class. Every person in, look at one class in specific, every person in the room hears the same words coming out of my mouth. They have the same manual. They have the same support after the class. Everything's identical. And a certain percentage of them will go on and do phenomenally well, do great. Another percentage of them will do absolutely terrible, lose all their money. I mean, go off and just just lose their, their entire life savings in some cases. So, and, and that, it's, to me, I don't know. I feel the same way you do. I feel bad for the ones that don't do well. But I, I, I know it's not me because obviously the ones that are doing well took the same information and made it work. So uh, I, I know where you're coming from when you say that. It's like you think, well, did I say something wrong? But obviously, no. It's, yeah, it's, no, look, it's one of the, probably the, the one that really made the decision very easy for me was a gentleman who saw me a number of times and then shared with me that he had just quit his very good paying job, hadn't told his wife, had rented an office somewhere so he could go off and do the right. trading in private, had me come around to his home on the last occasion and said, look, if my wife comes home, tell her you're helping. If she comes into the room, don't tell her what you're doing. Tell her you're helping me with, I don't know, pick any random topic, you know, how to teach a dog how to walk or something. You know, <laughs> tell her you're, you're teaching me about something else. Don't mention trading. Don't mention the markets, whatever you do. This guy was doing this all in secret. And I thought, and this guy had limited experience, yet had given up his very good paying job, rented an office, made a commitment, and I thought, oh, I can't help this guy. I mean, had he asked me beforehand, hey, do you think I should quit my job? Do you think I should rent an office? Do you think I should keep this from my wife? No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I would have said that to him. And he made all these, what I thought were incredible decisions. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't help this guy. And I was emotionally invested now because I had spent the last 12 months with this person helping him learn about the most basic of things, some technical analysis and, you know, how to use a moving average and just simple things. And now I was, I get to know this guy and that was probably me. That was the one, that one session I'm going, wow, I just can't do this. This is not sitting well with me at all. Yeah. I don't know what this guy is going to look like in three months when he has told his wife, he hasn't made one cent from trading. And in fact, he's lost money. Mm -hmm. I, don't want to be there. I just don't want to be involved in it. Yeah, I have a similar story. I had one student, that I, which I didn't know about either, and he quit his job, took his pension, which was 140000 And as I found out later, his monthly uh, bills was about ten grand a month. So he, he quit, took that money, was to start trading, thinking he was going to make ten grand a month or more to pay his bills. Never happened. And, you know, mathematical fact, after so many months, he's out of money. He had to sell his house. I mean, it was this whole same disaster story, I, and I, I felt terrible. But I didn't, I didn't tell him to do it, that's for sure. Yeah, look, so in that situation, he's looking to make almost 100% a year. Mm. And, you know, there are really significant expectations to place on yourself when you've been trading since breakfast. Right. You know, you have next to no experience, and all of a sudden you're, you have these expectations. If I can just talk about this one this particular subject, if I may, just quickly. Oh, you one of the things that I say to people is one of your goals, and you should set goals in everything in your life, but trading is no exception. One of the things I think, excuse me, with trading is you need to have a goal where in 12 months' time, you have, have every dollar that you started with. You have the ex exact same amount of money in your trading account as you started with in 12 months' time. And I say this for two reasons. And of course, this 
doesn't sit well with people because all people think about is how much money they're going to make. Right. And I'm saying, forget that. Just have all the money you started with in 12 months' time for two reasons. One, it makes you adopt a more defensive, protective uh, attitude or, or approach to your trading capital. But secondly, it makes you appreciate that um, this takes time mm -hmm. and you need to have the patience that this will not happen overnight. Um, I'm sorry. If it does, you'll be one in a million. It'll just be your lucky day. It'll just be your um, – it just doesn't happen. So that expectation of making lots of money, they, yes, that can happen, but not week one, not month one. So it's a very realistic goal to have every dollar you started with in 12 months' time, and even then most people won't achieve that. Have as you, simple as a goal as it is. Have you ever heard of Will Rogers? Sorry, what was the name? The Will, Will Rogers? Oh, yes. Okay, yes. One of his favorite sayings was he's not so concerned about return on his capital as much as the return of his capital. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah, I like that. The same thing. One of your other videos that I really enjoyed was the one where you had the two boxes and the marbles. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. It, it, if you want to go into that at all, I, I yeah, thought... I, thank you. I, I Look, I have um, made me laugh because I presented that particular example hundreds of times all around the world. And, in fact, I've even delivered that to audiences where um, no one speak, spoke English in the audience and they all had headsets on. Um, we're listening to a you know, simultaneous translation, or there was a guy standing next to me in China and he had to relay everything I said in Mandarin. So I presented, and I can picture all those now, so I presented that particular exercise countless times all around the world for many years. And and I always get the same responses, as I say. It doesn't matter where you are from, what language you speak, what you look like. It doesn't matter. We're all deep down. We're all human beings. We're all people and we're all wired in very similar ways. And so without having that graphic available to us, the, the whole idea is that, you know, I, I present a couple of different scenarios. One is where you have the opportunity to take money away from me and make money, or you have to give me money. And in the first scenario, um, I give you two options. And the options are, you know, two buckets or hats or boxes with marbles in them. And the first box has uh, some different coloured marbles. And, you know, my, three of them might be blue, one of them might be red. Um, and if you choose to put your hand in that box and pull out a blue marble, I'll give you $1,000. But if you're unlucky enough to pull out the red marble, which you can't see, you have to – and pull out the red, oh, bad luck. You don't get anything. You get zero. You walk away with nothing. But if you'd only picked up a blue marble, you would have taken $1,000. Um, the second box only has one marble in it, and you can pick whatever colour you would like. Let's make it green. And if you pull out that one marble – and there's only one marble in there, so you're guaranteed to get it – I'll give you $700. So you still make money, but not as much as the 1000 from a blue. So in summary, these two choices could be described as a risk and a certainty. The certainty is one marble. The risk is having that red one there as not making anything. And I then say to the audience, you can only come up once. You can only put your hand in one box and pull out a marble. Um, who wants to put their hand in box A and box B? So for box A, hardly anyone puts their hand up. And box B, which has the one marble, which is a certainty, everyone's hands go up. And and the simple, you know, the summary I provide on that is that when I presented with you with the opportunity to make money, you avoided risk and you went for certainty, right? You naturally just thought about, no, no, I don't want to take on that extra risk. I want to go for the certainty. And when that applies to trading is when you're in a profitable position and you have the opportunity to make money, we actually – intuitively or instinctively move away from risk and we go for certainty. And we, that means that we don't allow profits to run. We don't add to winning positions. We don't do all those things that we believe are time-tested trading principles because deep down we instinctively don't think about doing those things. We're hardwired to not do those things. And when we see a small profit on the table, we go, done, bang, I want it, trade closed, um, which then all comes into the bigger picture of managing risk. and. And that is, you know, average profit versus average loss and percentage of winning trades, percentage of losing trades, and that whole risk management, they're all the key performance numbers, you know, those four items. And people not appreciating that, you know, if I take this profit, how can I possibly lose money? Well, you will when your third or fourth trade or fifth or sixth is a really big loss. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can have two losing trades out of 10 and eight profitable trades and still lose lots of money. And people show that. 
Um, so that simple exercise is simply designed to, to give people one example of how if you don't think about it and you just instinctively respond, you'll often choose the wrong choice so far as a trader is concerned, which then leads me into, you know what, you need to have a plan. You need to have a set of rules, a structured process, a plan which tells you what you should be doing as opposed to just, you know, no plan and just doing this all instinctively off the top of your head because it won't work. Mm. Yeah, but what I found too is, and I help my students create trading plans. I preach to them how important they are. And they were, they create them, they write them, they swear by them, they start trading, something goes bad, something clicks in the head, fear kicks in, read kicks in, all of a sudden plans are out the window. It, you know, it's just it, panic city. I mean, it, no matter how thorough, how good the trading plan is, the emotions overrun it, kick it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't add much more than what you just said, and you summed it up pretty well. But, um, you know, we are people after all. And if you do have um, a bad streak where things don't work out, it is we, we just need any excuse, really, to ditch the structure, mm -hmm. uh, remove the discipline, um, eliminate that as, you know, and just go on our merry way and go on away away from that plan and away from structure. Um yeah, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's just all about the psychology and the discipline and the patience and the, the commitment and then all those, you know, key attributes that we talk about with traders. Um, yeah, it's very easy for someone to completely ditch the plan. If I can share with you one story, if I may, please. Um, a, a group of people, 45 or so in the room, I'd never done this before. I thought I would try it. So before I started, I said, here's a piece of paper for everyone, pull out a pen, can you please write, each of you individually, write down on that piece of paper the very worst trade you've ever had, ever in your entire life, the worst trade. Well, there were moans and groans and, oh, I don't want to remember that. Okay, let's write it down. I wrote down, you know, the stock uh, dates, entry, um, percentage of capital in that trade, exits if applicable, when, just went through it all. I then took them away uh, during a break and I had a look through them. And you, you could you could imagine the mm -hmm. types. You know, one hundred percent of capital. Uh, you know, bought it fifty seven dollars now worth three dollars twenty. Um, still in it. You know, you've heard all these stories before. Yeah. Well, I now had forty five of those, and I picked three just absolute classics. You know, one hundred percent of capital, still in it, or got out when it was worth two cents. Went through them all. Got three. Went back into the room. For the next session, I said, here are the details up on the screen. Here are the details of three stocks. Here's all the trade details that somebody in this room whom we don't know took this particular trade. Please now, within your groups, 15 people in each group, have a look at this particular stock, this particular trade for 10, 15 minutes. Please put together some ideas of why that person who is in this room, why that person didn't exit that particular trade at a more appropriate time, in a better time, at a better location. Why didn't they handle that trade better? Just have a look at some technical, anything. Just come up with reasons. Look at the volume, look at technical analysis, anything. So sure enough, the next 10 minutes, the room is full of noise, discussion. People pointing at, you know, obviously someone gets their laptop out and brings up the very chart of that particular stock. And there's really, um, really great discussion, lots of noise. I thought, wow, this is going far better than I had imagined. I've never done this before. This is going to be a good exercise. I will do this again, just simply because of the discussion and the noise and the interest. And at the end, 10 minutes, I had to stop them. Okay, stop. Let's, wow, that's fantastic. Great noise, great discussion. I walked around to some of the groups, real discussion. Okay, group number one, what was the trade you had, please? Oh, that was that. Okay, I pulled up the chart so everybody in the room could see. Okay, is there a spokesperson? But, yep, okay, John, can you step up, please? Okay, John, uh, you had 15 minutes there, 15 people. Here's the trade. Give us some of the reasons that you came up with why that person didn't exit at a more appropriate time. And John stands there and goes, <laughs> Yeah, we got nothing. What? Wait, hang on. You were talking there for 15 minutes, 15 of you with good trading experience, and you couldn't come up with one reason. No indicator, no volume spike, no support level, nothing. And he's going, no, we're just sorry. Group two, three, same? Same. 
wow. Again, something happened that I didn't expect. And I very quickly surmised and expressed this to the group. I said, wow, when this person who is in this room somewhere who didn't want to own up, when this person was faced with that particular trade day after day after day, they thought of every excuse under the sun not to get out, every excuse under the sun, yet nothing that 15 people with 15 minutes of hindsight and no emotion could come up with any reasons, yet this person thought of every excuse they could to justify staying in that trade for as long as they did. So you talk about you know, diverging from a plan, diverging from discipline and structure. Um, we are the weakest link. You cannot overstate that. And we can talk about emotions all day and talk about the influence that all of those fear and greed and all those things have on us. And I think, you know, it only takes time. The best medicine for that is time. You cannot, and I'll just finish on this point, you know, I think trading is a microcosm of your life. If you are, and I'm not suggesting any of these people were messes in their normal lives, but if you are, you know, completely undisciplined in your life, have no structure, your life is a mess, how you can possibly expect to walk into a trading office into your office, open up your laptop or your tablet and flick, oh, it's over here, flick a switch mm -hmm. where you, know, you become disciplined instantly and become a really good trader and become very disciplined. It just doesn't work that way. You yeah. are here you know, and you bring all that to the trading environment. In my classes, I like to say how you do one thing, you probably do everything. Same deal. If, if you're disciplined uh, in life, correct. you're probably going to be disorganized in trading. Exactly. And so trading is obviously what we're talking about and that's where you bring all that. And if you are, you know, ill-disciplined and all that, how can you flick a switch and become a different person? Well, what I like to preach to them though is maybe, maybe if you can figure out how to become more structured, more organized, more disciplined in your trading, maybe it'll, it'll go backwards. Maybe then that'll influence your life and you might be, your life might get better. You know, you might become more organized where you weren't before. But maybe agreed. agreed. And, I, and I think, yeah, agreed. And I think a really important question a lot of people ask, and I don't think a lot of people have a very good way of responding to or answering, and that is, you know, I remember vividly someone standing up in a group environment and saying, Stuart, I agree with everything you're saying. I, talk, I, I agree with the discipline part, but I know I have no discipline. I know that. I'll, I'll totally agree with you and I'll be very open with you. I have no discipline. How do I become more disciplined? Because I'm convinced I need it, but I'm telling you now I'm not. I have no discipline in my life. How do I do that? And I think the way to do this is to set small steps. Um, and that is, just, excuse me, take it small piece by small piece. For example, you know, great time of the year we talk about New Year's resolutions. Oh, this year I'm going to become that fitter, you know, healthier me, um, every day I'm going to do 30 minutes of physical activity, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, by week, whatever, or day 14 or whatever it is uh, of the new month, all gone. 95% of people, it's all out the window. But that's because it's too unrealistic to flick a switch and become a different person. I think gradual steps are what's important. And what I say to people is, okay, you want to exercise, you want to do, just go out and walk, um, you know, for 30 minutes every day. Don't make that your New Year's resolution where you'll do it every day forever. How about week one, just make it three days out of the seven. That's it. Just three. Um, in other words, there's four other days where you can sleep in or sit on the couch or be inactive. But three days you have to do it. And you, you know, everybody can do that. Everybody could get out for one or two or three days. But seven days in a row and then another seven, no, probably not. Three days, two Easy. Everybody can do it. Then the weekend, do nothing. Next week, do another two days. The week after, do three days. Week after, do three. Then maybe four. Then maybe five. You've got to change. You know, we are habitual creatures and we bring those habits into trading. Um, you know, all the things you do when you get home from the shops, from groceries, you walk in your front door, probably the next four things you do without even thinking because you do it all the time. We're very habitual. Um, so to change those habits takes time and you just don't do it by flicking a switch. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I talk to people about with discipline is you need to, yes, make a commitment and that's very good, but do it gradually. Change those habits um, very slowly. 
and then they become new habits. And the whole idea of being active five days a week is actually just you don't even think about it right. because now it happened and you do it. But three months ago, you weren't doing it at all. Right. So I think the same in trading. Mm. Well, if we wanted to wrap this up with uh, a good ending, what would you advice would you give, let's say, a new trader that's, that's it maybe hasn't started thinking about starting or maybe he has started just in the early stages to uh, help him avoid that 90% failure rate that uh, the new traders have? Any, any, any tips, advice? Uh, yeah, I've got a few. I, I know in my book I present a whole list of, you know, getting started, if not get half. But, um, certainly taking it slowly and being patient. Um, you know, people have, I think people are sold on the idea and guess what, I was one of them when I went to a sales seminar back in 1996 and I should have said this earlier when that's how I got, you know, I went to the sales, in fact, 1999, I'll take that back, which is just before I did all the courses. Um, in 99, I got sold on the whole idea of this guy had a screen up with, you know, a chart or two and numbers everywhere and I thought, wow, I can do this. Like the maths that he was going through, I could follow and I thought, you know, how easy. And then I, sure enough, I saw, you know, wrote out a check and joined his course. And that's where I did the first structured course. But I think people have ideas of grandeur and being, wow, I can make lots and lots of money from this. This can be really exciting. Give up the day job, et cetera, et cetera. So people come in with very high expectations, but I think they're very unrealistic. And I think a key to start with is have more realistic expectations. That whole idea of trading for 12 months and not making anything doesn't sit well with people, but it's a very realistic goal to set yourself because it's quite likely you won't even achieve that, let alone make $1. Uh, so take it slowly, be patient, get educated. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that have come before you and done this, <clears throat> learn from them. You don't have to follow them, you know, step by step, but certainly follow their framework, you know, what they do. Um, one of the things that I, I just digress a little bit, I remember doing a presentation to about 100 people and the main guy who organised this, probably something what you would do, you know, every month you get his people together and get a guest speaker to come in and I was that guest speaker and I spoke for one hour and at the end one guy said, hey, the guy who organises this doesn't agree with that. He doesn't think you should do that, but you do. Huh, you know, tension, wow, you know, this is drama. You know, how come you disagree on that? And the guy stepped in and gave a very, very good response. And he said, you're focusing on the wrong thing. He said, you shouldn't focus on what we do differently. You should focus on what we both do the same because that will be the keys. If we both manage risk, cut losses, keep trades small, if we, don't, if we do all these things and we all think, you know, we both do those, they're probably the keys. Mm -hmm. The fact that he uses a 200 moving average and I use this, insignificant. Don't focus on what we do differently. Focus on what we do the same. But definitely get educated. Yeah, take it slowly. Be disciplined. Uh, Realise it's actually hard work. Yeah, it's really hard work. And it's probably the hardest easy money you'll come across. Yeah. For the beginning trader, do you believe in paper trading? To an extent. Yeah, I think uh, yes and no. Emotions don't kick in there. Say again. Emotions don't kick in, paper trading. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's why I sort of, yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, I started it. I couldn't commit to it. You know, day three, I'm going, this is a waste of my time. Um, this is easy to not do. It's easy to forget. It's easy to not worry about because it wasn't real money involved. I'll check it on the weekend. I'll go back and review it. It just was difficult for me. Maybe it worked for other people. I do very much believe in testing, though I think what testing did for me is actually taught me a lot about technical analysis. I actually learned about things that did work and didn't work, and I think that's pivotal in when you're developing your own strategy to have a basic idea of this sort of concept works. You know, if we're belting up against resistance and it breaks through, then that resistance often becomes support. I can, I can use that information. I can use that to my advantage. I learned that through testing because I was looking at so many charts. It was ridiculous. I learned what worked and what didn't work. So I do believe in testing paper trading there. I mean, I put it in my book as an idea because people talk about it just like you have. You know, you ask the question, but you're right. I mean, 99% of your success is not tested in any way, shape or form, and that's the six inches in between your ears. It's not tested at all. So it can be a very different result from paper trading to then real trading, no doubt about it. And one more thing I want to mention before we go, I, and one of the things I listened to you say in another one of your videos is that uh, you talked about how important psychology is. 
So what I talk about in mind, which is exactly what you were saying, is I feel you have three kinds of psychologies that you need to worry about. Yours, your direct customers, because in our case, we sell options. So we're selling to people. So we have to understand how their mind is working. Again, the gambler mentality, in other words, psychology of that. And then you have what you also talked about, the mass market psychology, which is really what technical analysis does for you. It, it's about mass market psychology. So again, that was two things that, that I was listening to you say. I go, that's, I agree. You know, that's what I said. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, technical analysis to me is almost nothing to do with financial markets. It's everything to do with the study of mass psychology. Mm -hmm. It's studying the way people behave en masse when presented with certain scenarios. When situations arise and price belts up against resistance, we are watching the way people en masse behave and respond to that. And then as technical analysis, you know, we sit on the sidelines and apply our rules objectively and take advantage of those situations. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, my, I could keep you here for hours, but, uh, but I guess we've done good. So uh, uh, if people want to get a hold of you and find out more about what you do, uh, where would they go? Uh, just search my name, stuartmcfee.com. Um, get easy. hold of me that way. Yep, easy. All right. Well, Stuart, thanks. And, uh, Very well. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Mine too. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.